In this special summer series of the Afternoon Light podcast, we're releasing the 10 presentations from our inaugural conference held on the 18th of November 2021. The conference theme was Menzies Early Years, Success, Failure, Resilience. In this episode, you will hear from University of Wollongong Professor Gregory Malouche, who presented on The Idea of Education According to the Young Menzies, 1916 to 1945, followed by La Trobe University's Emeritus Professor Judith Brett, who presented on Menzies' Debt to Deaconite Liberalism. One of the peculiar aspects of Sir Robert Menzies uh, was his enthusiastic advocacy of the cause of liberal education. I say peculiar because such a stance was in fact highly unusual in Australia, at least outside fairly limited university circles. And I think also, also because as we heard in the last paper, Menzies was not a classicist uh, and there's strong connections between classicists and advocacy of liberal education, both both here and in other places. When I read Menzies on education, it's not John Henry Newman who comes to mind, but rather Samuel Taylor Coleridge and the views expressed in his essay on church and state. That is to say, Menzies' appreciation of the value of liberal education is primarily political, I think, rather than philosophical or theological. The good that a liberal education bestows relates to the political and social order. Hence, Menzies invokes such imperatives as education for democracy, education for citizenship. There is, we believe, a very powerful connection between Menzies' educational ideals and his lifelong attachment to the Westminster system of government, which David Kemp talks so uh, eloquently about in volume four of his history. Liberal education would produce the sorts of people that made that system of government work properly. Equally, Menzies' idealisation of the English and the way that they conduct themselves is not really a slavish devotion to his imperial masters, but rather an appreciation of how a democratic political order should work at a time when democracy was under considerable attack. So we really need to think of Menzies, I think, in terms of the times in which he lived. So one needs to place Menzies in context to see why and how his views on education and specifically the value of liberal education developed. And it looks a little bit like this. Menzies spends his early years in the bosom bosom of a powerful empire that's at its zenith. His first 20 years were spent in peaceful and stable world. He would have had every expectation that the British Empire was only in its infancy and could possibly run for centuries. So take the comparison with Rome, you know, it's in its early days. Rome, Rome, he would have thought it had centuries ahead of him. Um, Then began the days of tribulation, World War I, depression, world conflagration, And we must understand Menzies as he develops up until the end of World War II in the context of these changes. Menzies decided that he stood for democracy as the expression of his British heritage in a world that was facing fascism and communism in the 1930s and in a world in which liberal democracy could come to an end if you're looking at the viewpoint of the late 30s, early 40s. This is, so we've got to recapture that context, that sense of what it was like to be living through the 30s and the 40s, the war, to, to get an appreciation, I think. So Menzies decided early that, that um, he stood for democracy as the expression of his British heritage and he, he first writes on universities. Is this the right way around, the right way around? In, no, that's not the right way around. Have I, have I gone to the second one? Ah, no, it's the first one. Oh, well, leave that. I'll, yeah, at this time at Melbourne University, but I'm not, that will be in the, the extended paper, but not today. 
In the wake of the depression and the rise of communism, fascism, Nazism, Menzies, I think, becomes more strident in his defence of democracy and his identification of democracy with Britain, especially England. Hence, like Hancock, W.K. Hancock, he condemns dictatorship as the victory of Machiavelli. And I don't think he's defending England because he's some English reactionary in empire, but rather because it provides the best model of a stable democracy for a British country such as Australia. So he's got a concrete, the last concrete example of a working democracy. Well, it's England. So why wouldn't you look at the English model? In the measure of the years, Menzies indicates that his interest in education was really only fully developed in the wake of World War II. However, it is clear that his interest in Britain and the preservation of democracy led him to develop his ideas on this matter in the 1930s. He approached education from the viewpoint of idealism and the need for spirit and the way in which these features were concretely expressed in English schools and universities. He understood that the institutions of a democratic order needed to be underpinned by an appropriate culture. And his developing ideas on education indicate what sort of culture that should be and the best way of bringing it about. He was a democratic elitist. In other words, he believed democracy meant a country being run under the Westminster system by an elite. Those with talent would be given the opportunity to develop that talent and use it to serve the community. Those individuals would receive a liberal education as to enable them to expand their capacity beyond narrow materialism and self-interest. They would be ones who ensured that democracy worked as it did within the framework of the Westminster system. They would stand above the sordid particular interests of the everyday world. Now, this vision, interestingly enough, has powerful platonic and almost, and let's say, Hegelian resonances um, in the way that it's understood. There's the idea that in Hegel, if you read Philosophy of Right, that, that the government of right stands above particular interests. I think Menzies understood that we needed people who stood above particular interests. These would be the, the, the bureaucrats the, who are given liberal education, so they have the proper training to do so. What we'd like to do is to examine what we believe are three key works by Menzies um, in between 1930s and 45. The first is a paper that he delivered on behalf, it was delivered on his behalf, the article tells us. I get to the next one at St John's College, Morpeth in 1937. Now, when I saw that he at least had a paper delivered on his behalf at St John's, that made me rather excited. St John's College, Morpeth, of course, is where Ernest Bergman had been, people like Elkin had been there, uh, and, and actually Bergman had hoped that St John's would become a university. So it was like a 1920s and 30s, 30s, Think tank. It's also hardly a place one would normally think of Menzies uh, in, if one was thinking in terms of sort of, you know, laissez-faire liberalism, for example. So it's interesting. In the paper, a report of which appears in the Newcastle Herald, the only place I could find it, Menzies stated that his primary theme was the relationship between modern civilization and the liberty of the individual. The test of civilization, he claimed, was freedom of the spirit and of the mind and the body. But the problem of what he termed a mechanical age was there had been advances in the realm of bodily freedom, but not necessarily in the realms of spirit and the mind, leaving the problem of a liberated body inhabited by a stunted mind and a poor spirit. The key then was to establish the development of the mind and the spirit. Spiritual freedom necessarily involved intellectual freedom and the capacity to pursue the truth. The free mind and the free spirit were bound up together. The mind was the doorway of the spirit. The enemies were thus twofold. The first was a social order that was one two-sided in the materialist direction. Now, that certainly has Coleridge um, resonances. I don't know if you read Coleridge, but it sounds very much 
like that sort of position that the, the, the church encourages was meant to react against those sorts of materialist and commercial uh, tendencies. The second was totalitarianism and the desire to glorify power in opposition to democracy that allowed the achievement of individual freedom and development. Menzies then moves to analyse what might be described as the evils of the modern world. These include the tendency in modern European history for liberty to degenerate into licence. Oh, wouldn't I love to hear a leader today say that? Liberty can degenerate into licence. Very 19th century, very 19th. No one uses the term licence anymore, do they? Uh, for the sober presentation of facts by the press to degenerate into propaganda, for the cinema to feed people's imagination with an absurd diet of false sentiment and false values. He summed up the problems with education in these terms. The new ambition was to breed a race of people to whom leisure was the chief end of life and the insistence upon a standard of accuracy abhorrent. Hey, that sounds a bit like certain tendencies today, I think, but uh, we won't go there. Education was already featuring as both a problem and a solution to the problems of the modern world. Again, a quote, the shrinking from the arduous labours of thought and the abdication of the responsibility of judgment good word judgment, in favour of somebody else constituted the subtlest of all attacks upon freedom because people made themselves slaves to someone else. Another quote, without minds that were informed, they toughened by exercise, broadened by inquiry and fearless in pursuit of truth, they could never hope to have spirits untrammeled by blinding ignorance or distorting prejudice. Freedom would never be gained without discipline, which was based on an intelligent understanding of the fact that order and unity were essential if the liberty of the individual was to be reconciled with the rights of other individuals. Notice the education, discipline. People often misunderstand what a liberal education is. Liberal education is as much about really tough ways of thinking. It's not about sitting around on beanbags and throwing ideas out. It's actually got a toughness, which I think that's why I would classify that as liberal, a liberal mode of education. Okay, so he's got this viewpoint that's developing in the late 30s. The second thing I want to look at is the 1939 pamphlet on education, which gives some ideas of how, how his views on liberal education have a political implication. Again, it can be noted that Menzies is reacting against aspects of the modern world of which he either disproves or find repugnant. One is material progress, mechanical progress, a sort of Frankenstein monster which may yet destroy us. The other is the uncertainty of the age. Today, when old beliefs are being challenged and old values are being reassessed, and when barbaric philosophies of blood and iron are repugnant, again, he's responding to the terrible circumstances of the late 1930s, blood and iron, dislocation in the wider world. It is a world in which the mere mechanics of life threaten to be the sole vocation of the human spirit. In opposition to these infirmities of the modern age, the university has a special role in place. It has what Menzies terms great and magnificent responsibilities. Those responsibilities relate to what Coleridge had termed permanence. In a world of flux and commerce and change, universities express permanent features of nationality, this is Coleridge, that transcend what might term modernity. So again, it seems he's on this sort of theme. The idea that universities, I think it's an idea that's permeated down to today, is alike in a secular world, the new church. But Coleridge never said that the church was Christian. So it's a, it's a sort of idea of a church as a sort of element of political element of society that has a function to play just as the public service and the law have a function. I think that's how Menzies, I think, that's how I would interpret it anyway, has, understands that universities are also part of the constitution in the wider sense. So Menzies defends universities as the place where academic learning occurs, an activity that's both civilised and civilising, an activity that the world needs as never before. Menzies defended useless scholarship 
because it represented sanity in an insane world, that it stands for a due proportion in life and living, that it develops the humane and imperishable elements of man, that it points the moral that the mere mechanics of life can never be the sole vocation of the human spirit. This is clearly a defence of the permanent elements in humanity. Those elements are difficult to express in the flux and hurly-burly of everyday life. So the, the university, I think, and Menti's formulates this, although implicitly, is really a bit like a church it ha in terms of its, its role, but it's not a sectarian church, of course. So I'm just going to skip a little bit. because I'm. But what, what does attract him also is the calm and tranquility of the life of study and conversation. Rather would I be the man who, when the tumult and shouting dies, enters into the company of his books and thoughts and the conversation of his friends. Again, this sort of image invokes to me the image of, say, Montaigne amongst his books, or Cicero when he's forced out of political life, the, the, the need to get the balance correct in political life between the world of political action and the need for reflection. And I think that's how, again, he understands the university. Um, he need, there needs to be a balance between the active life and the contemplative life. We cannot... But a life, he says, we cannot all live our lives in students' calm, but a life is not rich, which ones who... In, oh, I see, what have I done here? There's a page. Ah. Life is not rich, which contains no cloisters. Its place in a civilised community with a sense of real values would be secure. The academic world and the world of action need to be in dialogue to the benefit of each. University must serve as a liaison between the academician and the good practical man. And it's very pointed here that he refers to All Souls College Oxford. All Souls College Oxford was like a think tank. It had no undergraduates, very, very little in the way of postgraduates, and he may idealise this, but he sees, he sees as a place in which the practical men from London come down and mix with the academics to their mutual advantage. And I think that's very interesting. Again, that's a political conception of what the university is. It's a place that brings the two, two together. He says, all souls is a window through which Oxford looks out in the world and the world looks at Oxford. It's also interesting in the 1930s that All Souls College, all souls College Oxford was in fact the home to one W.K. Hancock. And there's, there's a, a various stages, Hancock and Menzies are in fact reacting, I think, in very similar ways to the crisis of the 1930s, if you read some of Hancock's work. Um, am I going for time? I've got two minutes. Well, I'll just say I was going to talk about the 1945 piece, but in a way he's reiterating part of what he says in the earlier pieces, except that in the, by 1945 one of the changes is there is that whereas he's talked perhaps in more metaphysical terms before the war, in, in the period in this the speech of 1945, he talks again about pagan and materialist quality of education. He talks in terms of, um, of um, you know, religion, need for obligation. Uh, but he's, the, the, there seems to be a slight shift where he says the problems, um, he says war after war is the result of a failure of the human spirit not of some superficial elements, but a fatal inability of man to adjust himself to other men in a social world. So I, there's a change, slight change in emphasis where it's moving towards social relationships, which isn't so much in the earlier stuff. You will now hear from La Trobe University's Emeritus Professor Judith Brett, who presented on Menzies' debt to deaconite liberalism. When I was researching my book on Robert Menzies' Forgotten People, which David forgot to mention, <laughs> it was uh, published in uh, 1992 before Alan Martin's book. And one of the th contributions I think it made was that for the first time it published the Forgotten People speech in full, 
at the beginning. I'd found uh, the speech in the archives when I was looking for something to give a class to read that would help them understand why Menzies was so powerful and uh, started thinking about it. Now, when I was doing that research, I spent some very fruitful hours browsing in Menzies' library. And as was a habit of many people of Menzies' days, Menzies would often underline passages in books he was reading in pencil. I used his underlinings in a copy of Shakespeare's play on Macbeth, play Macbeth, for insight into the role of Lady Macbeth and female ambition in his political imagination. But the greatest find was a scrap of newspaper that fell out of his pocket edition of Edmund Burke. It was dated the 18th of December, 1942, when he was on the back bench and in the middle of the radio broadcasts to the forgotten people. And he was thinking about how to make non-labour into a viable political force. Now, Burke's discussion of the purpose of political parties in his thoughts on the present discontent was heavily marked as including the very famous definition of party of, of Burke's, that it's a body of men united on some principle uh, in the, to work for the interests of the, nation, of the national interest. I can't quite remember the words, but it, it supports David's argument about, about the way he wanted a political party. He saw the importance of that being founded on principle. And he also underlined Burke's advice to public men on how to live a good life. So here was first-hand evidence of Menzies in 1942 looking to earlier thinkers for guidance. So what I want to do today is to explore the influence on Menzies of another earlier political figure, Alfred Deakin, and the moderate liberal tradition of Deaconite liberalism, which carries Deakin's name. Menzies regarded Deakin as Australia's greatest prime minister. He called him the great constructor who created Australia's basic national policies of irrigation, immigration, defence and tariff policy, the High Court and the Commonwealth Court of Conciliation and Arbitration. And in the mid-1940s, he argued against other options that the new non-Labor Party should be called the Liberal Party, as was the first united federal non-Labor Party, which Deakin led in 1909. So what, what is Deakinite liberalism? It refers to the policies and the philosophy of one of the two non-Labor parties that came together in 1909 at Fusion to form the first joint non-Labor party. These two parties were the Victorian-based Liberal Party, led by Alfred Deakin, and the New South Wales-based, then Anti-Socialist Party, led by George Reid. This party had earlier been called the Free Trade Party, and was the Deaconite Liberals' major opponent during the debates over federation and for the first half of the first decade of the 20th century. The main point of difference between the two parties was trade. Deaconite Liberals were protectionists. Reid's party supported free trade. And just to um, answer the question that Tim Lindsay raised earlier about conservatism and liberalism in Australia and how those terms are used, basically all Australians are liberals in the sense that they're against entrenched privilege, inherited privilege, they're for the basic democratic rights. Um, they, 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 the country didn't have an established church, uh, it didn't have an aristocracy, it didn't have an a, a, a widely established military in the same way. So the social supports of English conservatism weren't here. So George Reid, who Deacon would call a conservative, was also a liberal. So um, it, it, it's quite confusing. But uh, to, to go back to the differences between Deacon and Reid, the differences over trade had their roots in the different economic histories of the two colonies. Free trade was a core belief of British liberals. It was forged in the campaign against the Corn Laws during Britain's hungry 40s. But in Victoria, after the gold rushes, many liberals abandoned free trade uh, in support of protection. Jobs were needed for the gold rush immigrants. Victoria's population had swelled sevenfold in less than a decade, and protected manufacturing was the answer along with land reform. So Victorian liberals argued that circumstances here in the colonies were different from, from in Britain and the protection was justified so that infant industries could grow and the colony develop. New South Wales, by contrast, didn't face the same unemployment crisis, 
and it had a more developed and export-oriented pastoral economy. So New South Wales Liberals remained wedded to free trade. Now, Victoria's gold rush immigrants of the 1850s shaped the political culture of the new colony, which had just separated from New South Wales. They were mostly young and literate with a high proportion of skilled artisans. Their policies were influenced by Chartism, the working class political movement which demanded democratic reform of Britain's class-based political institutions. In Victoria, the catalyst for this reform was Eureka, um, but by the 1860, most of the Chartists' political demands had been achieved. There were no property qualifications and there was manhood suffrage for elections to the lower house. There was secret ballot and regular electoral redistributions. And in 1870, Victoria became the first of the Australian colonies to uh, grant the fifth of the Chartists' demands, which was payment of members of parliament. Now, both of Menzies' grandfathers were gold rush immigrants. And I think um, just to, to pick up on something that, that Troy said, he said to understand Menzies, you under, need to understand Japarat. I think you actually only need to understand Ballarat because Japarat come, is, is basically an offshoot of, of Ballarat. It's where both his parents grew up. Um, and Troy mentioned his mother's father, the Cornish miner, John Sampson. John Sampson, uh, when Menzies describes himself as a conservative when he's arguing with his grandfather, I took that to mean that he would he opposed the arguments for union preference um, and and much of the arguments about about trade unions that would have been coming from the labor the labor press that he was reading. John Sampson was Menzies remembers keenly political though not rigidly partisan a great one for Alfred Deakin, who was the federal member for Ballarat until Deakin retired in 1913. Keenly political, though not rigidly partisan. Menzies' description of his grandfather, Samson, could well as well describe the politics of Alfred Deakin as he managed the unstable parliament of the first decade. For the first 10 years of the new Commonwealth, no party had a majority. The reason being the spectacular electoral rise of the federal Labor Party. At the end of the 19th century, when the constitution was being shaped, the major lines of political difference were between New South Wales free traders and the Victorian protectionists and between the more and less populous states. Labor had formed in the colonies, but it played little role in the debates about federation. The established politicians didn't expect Labor to have much impact on the new Commonwealth Parliament either. How wrong they were. The first federal election, uh, returned 16 Labor candidates to the House of Reps, and as neither the Conservative Free Traders nor the Liberal Protectionists won a majority, so Labor held the balance of power. This was a new and unanticipated line of division. Labor's share of the vote rapidly increased until 1910, when it became the first major party to hold majority government. And as Prime Minister, Deakin relied on Labor support for much of his legislation. For those who were used to the more fiercely partisan politics that followed fusion and more disciplined party behaviour, Deakin's ambivalence about party has always been a blot on his reputation. But this is to judge him anachronistically. Deakin believed in a unified national interest, which grew out of the experiences of Australians and the particular challenges that they faced. He always said he put policy before party and the national interest before the strategic electoral interest. He would compromise his policy um, with his opponents, sorry, he'd compromise with his opponents to achieve his policy goals, as was regularly required of the leader of minority government. And he believed that this wasn't a sign of weakness, but of strength, and that the politics that resulted from compromise would be stronger for their reliance on a range of stakeholders. In 1940, when the country was at war, Menzies too was leading a minority government dependent on the support of two independents. Twice, Menzies invited Labor to form a national government, and twice John Curtin replied that while cooperating with the government in the war, they would cooperate in, with the government in the war effort, but Labor wouldn't surrender its freedom of action. When Menzies calls Deacon the great constructor, He's making a judgment that the building of institutions and policies according to one's conception of the national interest is the key test of prime ministerial achievement. 
not partisan victories or the winning of, elected, of elections. He doesn't call him a great, the greatest fighter or the fiercest political warrior. Now, Menzies held power in very different circumstance, political circumstances from Deakin when Australian parties were more disciplined and the political arena more obviously partisan. Yet when he won an election, he would tell the electors that he didn't govern just for those who voted for him, but for all Australians. And when he said this, like Deakin, he was projecting the possibility of a unified national interest which the government would serve. Now, I know other prime ministers also sometimes say this, but not all of them live up to it as well as Menzies or Deakin. Menzies shared with Deakin a commitment to individual conscience and freedom of judgment. These commitments are the motive springs of liberalism with uh, their roots in the struggles against feudal and monarchic privilege and in the Protestant Reformation. But they need to be refreshed and rethought as political circumstances change. In the history of Australian liberalism, the rise of the Labor Party to a party of government and the consequent fusion of erstwhile competing parties was such a change. In Victoria before fusion, Labor's electoral success was largely at the expense of the middle class Liberals who held the inner city working class seats and regarded themselves as friends of the workers. Labor wouldn't agree to electoral immunity for sitting members despite frequent pleas from Deakin. George Reid saw the inevitability of the formation of a united non-Labor party earlier than Deakin, but in 1909, Deakin bowed to the inevitable to become leader of the new fused party. This was a traumatic decision for Deakin and for his Liberals to turn against those with whom they'd cooperated and join with those who had been their chief political enemy. So how could they justify it and explain it to themselves? The solution was to focus on Labor's disciplined organisation and especially on the pledge that was required of Labor candidates to support Labor policy and to vote in Parliament as the majority of caucus determined. At the launch of the Commonwealth Liberal Party in 1909, Deakin attacked Labor's disciplined party machine in which a small committees, sorry, in which small committees made binding decisions outside the lights of day and which asked a voter and his representative to put aside the only thing which made him a man, his judgment and his conscience. This difference in organisational philosophy became a major line of demarcation between Labor and the first Liberal Party and its successors. Menzies, you remember, put it to devastating effect in the 1963 election when he attacked Labor's 36 faceless men. At the core of this difference in organisational philosophy is the different weight given to individuals over, to individual over collective action. Menzies also inherited from Deaconite liberalism a faith in the enabling state. Colonial states had built the physical infrastructure for settlement. In the 1890s, as old world poverty appeared in Australia, many Australian liberals also embraced social liberalism. Social liberals argued for a much broader conception of the state's responsibilities than classical laissez-faire liberals who wanted to limit the state's role to defence and the maintenance of law and order and leave the market to determine wages and working conditions. Social liberals, largely inspired by Christian humanitarianism, argued that the state should regulate working conditions and ameliorate poverty so that all its citizens could develop their God-given talents and potential to become full human beings. Now, debates about the role of the state in liberal democracies like Australia are always debates about balance. Balance between individual freedoms and the collective good and balance between private enterprise and public provision. Deakin saw the state as an agent for progress and he was optimistic about its capacities. This optimistic view of state action is I think also evident in Menzies. Opening the Albury Conference in 1944, he said that non-Labor had been put in a position of appearing to resist political and economic progress and so was being branded reactionary. But he said, there was no room in Australia for a party of reaction there is no useful place for a party of negation. We took the name Liberal, he later wrote, because we were determined to be a progressive party willing to make experiments and in no sense reactionary. In rejecting a party of negatives, Menzies was echoing Deacon's famous rejection of George Reid as offering nothing but a necklace of negatives. 
And he was also positioning non-labour as a progressive political force, open to new ideas and directions. After he won government in 1949, he embraced much of Labor's post-war nation-building agenda. And when I write the longer version of the paper, I'll, I'll fill out the ways in which um, I think you can see Menzies embracing an enabling state in many of the policies he carried into the 1950s. Now, I want to conclude with a slightly more speculative reflection on the probability that Menzies looked to Deakin as a role model for the well-lived liberal political life. Both men were Victorians, influenced by the liberal political culture of the Victorian goldfields. Both were sons of small businessmen. Deakin's father ran a coaching business that was later taken over by Cobb & Co. Both were educated at Melbourne private boys' schools, both studied law at the University of Melbourne, though Menzies was a far more successful and distinguished lawyer than Deacon ever was. Both men were great readers and lovers of literature. Both also spent some time on the back bench after resigning from high office and used this time to renew their political commitments and take on foundational political work. Deacon um, spent time on the back bench during the 1890s and then threw himself into the cause of federation. Menzies um, into building a new non-Labor party. Both men were motivated by an ideal of service to the nation and returned to high office with their greatest politi political achievements still before them. The parallels are many, and they would have been obvious to Menzies. For him, I suggest Alfred Deakin would have been a seminal figure. Now, perhaps there's confirmation of my hunch in his library. I wasn't interested in Deacon when I was looking at the library in the late uh, 1880s. And the only books of Deacon's that were available during Menzies' lifetime were two books on India, which he was unlikely to have owned. He is likely, however, to have owned and read Walter Murdoch's affectionate biography that was published in 1923. So when I get the chance, I will go and have a look at um, to see if there's a copy on the shelves with underlining that prove my hunch attesting to the admiration that Deacon had, sorry, that Menzies had for Deacon and his influence on his own political life. Thank you. We hope you're enjoying this special summer series of the Afternoon Light podcast featuring presentations from our recent conference on Menzies' early years success, failure, resilience. This week you heard from... University of Wollongong professor Greg Malouche in his presentation on the idea of education according to young Menzies, followed by La Trobe University's emeritus professor Judith Brett, whose presentation was on Menzies' debt to Deaconite and liberalism. Next week, you will hear from Menzies Research Centre fellow Dr David First roberts whose presentation was on A Simple Presbyterian in Politics, Robert Menzies' Liberalism and Anti-Sectarianism. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to you joining us next week.